Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I want to know which one of you prayed summer back. It was me. You in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> I was very content with our mild weather. Thank God. A <laughs> um, couple things before we get into the word. Um, first, I've got a, a number of challenges that I'm going to lay down today. Okay, and this is the first. The Christian movie, The War Room, is playing in Missoula. And I am challenging you. 4 o'clock, the, the movie starts at 4.15 today. I'm challenging you to be there, okay? Um, when this movie was first released, I was so disappointed because it was not playing anywhere in Montana. It was released in five states, and that was it. <clears throat> Labor Day weekend, it was the number one movie in the nation, okay? They brought it to Missoula. Let's give them a reason to keep bringing movies like that to Missoula. Okay? So, it's the 415 showing. Tickets should be $5.75. If you don't have it, come talk to me. I'll pay your way. It's that important. Okay? Because this movie is kind of wrapping up, showing everything that we've been talking about for the last couple months. Okay? Um, so th that's the first challenge I'm going to lay down to you. Um, as we go on, I'm going to present you with, with at least one more. Uh, Thursday, at the brothers' meeting, um, is, is it warm in here to anyone besides me? Yeah. I, I'm not trusting you or you. <laughs> and, and are any Montanans here? Yeah. Would somebody slip out and open that door, please? Get some air moving in here. Um, I'll bring you a blankie. <laughs> Thursday. We have been uh, in the brothers' meeting. We've been going over topics. Uh, somebody will present a topic, and then we study it. We come back together, and, and we discuss it. And um, we've had everything from... Uh, were dinosaurs on the ark to predestination to um, polygamy. And this week we talked about abortion. But I, I kind of wanted to shift the focus a little bit. Um, because quite honestly, if you've been in this church any length of time, you know that our stance is that abortion is a sin. It is a grievous sin to the Father. Okay? It's an offense to him. And so it wasn't so much abortion right or wrong. It was more, what is our response? Okay? And I challenged the brothers at the meeting. What can we do? Okay, what should we do? What should we be doing? Are we doing enough? And we had some really good conversation. And we had people that were willing, all right, you know what, let's step up. Let's take a look at some things that we can do to address this, okay? October 4th is the uh, life chain, all right? Um, look around, our church is not huge. But they have given us the space of three churches because that many people show up from this body. And I am blessed beyond belief at how many of you would take that time to go down and stand. All we do is stand and hold signs. And we tell them that, that abortion's wrong. You are killing. You are murdering. This is a life. And I, I, that's another challenge. October 4th. We are going to go down and we're going to stand in front of Cornerstone Realty, and we have the entire block all the way down to Walgreens. And usually we have enough people to help fill on the other side of the street, over by Wimps Auto Body. And I want to encourage you, come out, 
take a stand. Make sure people know where you stand on this issue. Okay? So there's challenge number two. We are talking about spiritual warfare, and, and I'm going to start by confessing. Um, I, I have not mastered this at all. As a matter of fact, this last week, I have been brutalized more than I have in probably a year. And to be honest with you, a couple of times I just I threw up the white flag. Said, I, 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 I surrender. I'm done. I can't do this. And it's shaming to hear someone, your wife or your child, preach the message that you preached last week right back to you. So I, I want you to understand, I'm not saying this because I'm there. I'm saying this because he says so. And if he says it, that's what we've got to stand on. Okay? So from this point, I want you to understand, I'm not looking down my nose at anybody. Okay? God makes very clear to me my shortcomings, my sins, my failures. Okay? What I'm sharing with you is what we... As his followers, as his children, what we need to be doing in this battle. So open your Bibles. We're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6. You guys should have this pretty well memorized at this point. We've dwelt here for a while. Um, so Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to pick up in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me for in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change, in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now we have spent quite a few weeks going over this passage, breaking it down, taking each component, looking at it, examining it, holding it up in the light of the rest of God's word to see how it should apply to our lives. Okay? First thing that we talked about is we stand in his strength, not our own. Okay? When we stand in our own strength, we have weeks like I've had this last week where you spend a lot of time eating dirt. Okay, because you're not standing, you're falling. All right? We stand in the strength of his might. And we put on the whole armor, all of it. He repeats himself several verses down. Take up, therefore, the whole armor of God. Every piece, every piece is vital. Okay? We have the belt of truth. 
I believe this to be a sincere heart, looking at things the way they are, not talking like a Christian, being a Christian, not putting on the, the facade, the mask, but being a Christian, humbling yourself, understanding the right relationship that you have with God. Because see, if you have come to him in faith, his grace has taken what you were and crucified it, buried it, and resurrected you anew. So you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but you are saved by grace unto a new creation. Okay? Truth. Understanding that this was not of anything you could do. All what he did. All right? So the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The heart guard. Okay? That's what the Romans called it. The heart guard. To protect your heart. Whose righteousness is this? The breastplate of righteousness. Whose is it? Christ. It's his. Because mine, mine is his filthy rags. Okay? So it's his righteousness. I stand before him, not of anything of my own. Not my own righteousness, but his righteousness. That's what he gave me at the cross. So I lay down my sin, he takes up my sin, and he hands me his righteousness. Okay? Breastplate of righteousness. Okay? We have the shield of faith. We talked about that. This isn't any little pie plate. This thing covers the entire front of you. And it works best in cooperation with other believers. So the person to my left is guarding my left. And the person to my right is guarding my right. And I'm doing the same for both of them. It works cooperatively. It works together. Okay? It's this that quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy. Okay? How often does the enemy come at you and he doesn't attack your faith? He's always attacking your faith. Oh, did God really say that? You really think God's going to do that for you? Really? Let's take a look at who you are. What you've done. You really think God wants anything to do with you? To which you respond with a resounding, Yes! That's the point of the cross! Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we looked at those. They're cleats. They're made so you can stand fast. Be unmoving. They can't move you. Now you can pick up and move. But the enemy can't move you. I really, I struggled today because I wanted to put a scene from Monty Python in the quest for the Holy Grail up there. I wanted to show you guys the French Tauner. Standing at the top of his castle wall. Your father was a hamster and your mother smelled of elderberries. Now go away or I will taunt you a second time. You crazy English knigots. Because see, that's what our enemy is. And we're going to get into that in a minute. All right? But I want you to hold on to that picture. Okay? That taunting voice shouting out from the security of his wall, hiding behind it, trying to get you to run away. Okay? Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. The preparation of the gospel. What's the gospel? It's that by which you were saved. Okay? It's very simple. You were lost and he found you. You were dead and he made you alive. Okay? Now, people can argue intellectually far beyond my capacity. All right? There's, I know there's a lot of people out there that are a lot smarter than I am. But they cannot change what God has already changed in me. What God did for me, they cannot dispute. 
Oh, they like to write it off. Oh, yeah, you know, everybody has that faith moment. That's, that's like a, an endorphin release and blah, 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 blah. Oh, really? An endorphin release lasts until it goes away. Now, I, I've heard that the runner's high. I think you've got to be high to run. <laughs> Personal. Okay? Amen. Amen. <laughs> but are you ready to share the gospel? Or are you sharing the gospel with those around you? Is that just part of your everyday life? Is that so entwined with who you are that, that it, you don't even think about it? It just falls out. Feet shot so we can't be moved. Shield in place to quench the darts. The helmet of salvation. <laughs> you got to put this on, folks. You've got to wear this. You have got to be firm in your thinking. You have to understand what has happened that you might be saved. Okay? The incredible cost that was paid to redeem you. Okay? You know what that means, to be redeemed. It means that you were a slave, you were owned, body, soul, and spirit. You are owned. You're not your own. You belong to the prince of the power of the air of this world. Redeemed means... That someone came and saw the price on you and decided you were worth it. And they paid that price in full. Nothing was left owing. You've got to lock that down in your mind. Because the enemy wants to attack your salvation, your position, your place. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And see, at my low, Christy came to me and she said, you have got to start standing on the word. Start quoting it. I didn't want to. I was frustrated. I was, I was down. I, I didn't see, I didn't see any light. And I didn't want to quote the scripture. That right there should have been a huge sign to me. But in order to quote the scripture, you got to what? You got to know it. Folks, I'm, I'm telling you, um, guidepost and daily bread are great, but they're not the word. Okay? Use them to help enlighten you to the word, but don't use them in place of the word. Get in the word. Know it. Become familiar with it. I mean, make it intimate. But see, we, we have a problem. Because see, we like to stop right there with spiritual warfare. We, we want to stop right there. We're all armored. But where's the battle fought? How do we fight this battle? You see, the, the verse goes right on for here. See, let's, let's look down here. <clears throat> verse 18. See, we just finished the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. <coughs> Paul goes right into the next thought. This is not a new thought. This is not a new thing. He's tying these things together. This is all one continuous thought. You want to know where the battle is fought? Yes. That's right. On our knees. <coughs> On our knees. See, pray. When do we pray? All times. All times. Thessalonians tells us that we pray without ceasing. We don't stop praying. It should become just a part of our thing, carrying on conversation with God as we go throughout our day. Praying at all times, in the Spirit, 
with all prayer and supplication. So what should we pray about? Everything. Everything. You think you got it going right? Pray about it. You think you got it going wrong? Pray about it. You're not sure where it is? Pray about it. This battle is waged in prayer. You, you understand that the fight that we fight really is about surrender. Right? You understand that? When, when we fight this spiritual battle, the only way we win is by surrendering, but not to the enemy. We have got to surrender to God. James chapter 4 tells us, that if we humble ourselves before God, then what happens? We can resist the devil and he will flee. Okay? Last week we talked about the temptation in the desert. Right? The devil came to Jesus and he challenged him and Jesus quoted scripture. The devil thought, I'll play that game, so he quoted more scripture. Jesus answered him with scripture. He rebuked him with scripture. Okay? And the devil left. Now, do you notice that there were three times that the devil came against him? So it's not going to be like a one and done. As a matter of fact, one of the Gospels says that when the devil left, he left until a more opportune time. Okay? See, this is not going to be something where you resist the devil and he's going to run away from you for the rest of your life. Okay? Now, I, I had an interesting revelation this morning as I was coming into church. Um, I came down Main Street, and I always turn right here on 4th, and there's that little power station right there on the, the corner, right? The, the phone station. And I, I've seen that thing probably thousands of times. And today, for the first time, as I looked right before I turned, I looked and I realized that their chain link fence, it's got those little strips of plastic running down through the chain link fence. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. It's, it's to provide privacy. Okay? And, and for the first time, I didn't look at the fence. I looked through the fence. And I saw the courtyard beyond. Okay? See, this, this God spoke to me in that moment. This is where we're stuck. This is where I was stuck. Because, see, I get into a situation, and I start looking at the fence. And I start thinking, wow. This is the end of the line. This is as far as I go. I'm, I'm here. I'm done. I'm stuck. But God says, no, you look through the fence. Because there's something on the other side. Look through the fence. Don't let that little strip of plastic that the enemy throws up so casually between you prevent you from seeing what God is taking you to on the other side. Yeah. Don't get so caught up in what is right in front of you, the situation or the circumstance that you find yourself in, that you forget that there is a God on your side that is going to take you through it and beyond. Ignore the plastic and look through it. So we wage this war in prayer. I have got an incredible wife. Okay? I have a praying wife. And she's learning to not defend herself, but to let God defend her. And she is learning to not speak out to me, but to cry out to God. And she is learning that he is fighting the battles for her. My wife prays for me a lot. And there, there are times where she stays up late into the night praying for me. I can be a turd. Uh-huh. I said that. <clears throat> I'll tell you what, if you don't think that Paul said worse than that, you're not reading the same Bible I am. Okay? I can be a stinker. Especially when I get frustrated. I get caught up in my flesh. 
and I start looking at the fence. And I want to just throw my hands up in the air and quit. And then she starts praying. She prays harder. She starts asking God, God, you've got to do something for him because I can't. And that's, that's something that we're learning as all through our married lives we tended to look at each other yeah. for answers and, and the answers aren't there. The answers are there. And I, I want to hold my wife up in honor and esteem before you because I make her life very difficult sometimes. Very difficult. But she's learned to fight the way that God has called us to fight. She has learned, instead of coming up against me, she gets on her knees and she prays. She humbles herself before God and she starts to resist the devil. Because one of the other things that the devil has really pulled on us over the years, and I guarantee you he's pulled on you too, is that we're each other's enemy. You start looking at people as your enemy. The devil's got you buffaloed. He's a deceiver. The enemy is not your spouse, your parents, your siblings, or whoever. The enemy is the devil. He's the one that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The only way to defeat him is by prayer by calling out to God and then standing firm on what he has said. Firm, not being moved. I will not give ground. Now the scripture tells us that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. Do you understand that picture? <clears throat> Jesus took the disciples to Caesarea Philippi. And he was speaking to them. And, and if you ever have the opportunity, Ray Vanderlaan did a, a message there at Caesarea Philippi. And it's incredible. It gives you very good insight into what was going on. But I want to just tell you one part. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my kingdom. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, do you notice something in common with those two passages of scripture? In both of them, the enemy is on the defense. You understand that? The devil is in his stronghold. The devil is locked behind his gates. And he's like that French taunter standing up on the battlement, shouting down at you. Oh, you're never going to be good enough! You are a lousy person! Pew, pew, pew! You think God wants anything to do with you? Pa! He sees all this sin in your life. Go away! And he comes against us with such vitriol sometimes. And the thing that's amazing is he's good at it. He's good at it. And he catches us. And he knocks us down. And all the while, we are supposed to be on the offense, moving into his territory, knocking those strongholds down, breaking those gates open, setting captives free. We're laying flat on our back because he yelled some words at us. He's a liar, and lies are his native tongue. That's all he knows how to do, is lie, lie, lie. See, this is why it's so important that we know this word. This is why it's so important that this has to be ingrained in us. You know what it's called? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you know where the spirit lives? Yes. If you are saved, you have got God's spirit living inside of you that will teach you everything you need to know everything, that will strengthen you for the battles, that will give you power to plant those feet and stand firm and not be moved. He
He has put you in a body so that you have people to your left and to your right who will shield you and guard you and look out for you. And sometimes they might need to give you a little poke so you get your eyes focused on where the enemy is. They might need to give you a little prodding. Hey, seems like you kind of got knocked down there. Here, let me help you up. Up on your feet. The battle's still going on. See, when does the battle end? <laughs> Not in this life. Not in this life. The devil is at it 24-7, 365. Now, you may have resisted him and he may have fled for a while, but I guarantee you, he's standing off at the periphery just waiting. It's like red light, green light. Did you ever play that when you were a kid? I hated that game. <laughs> I like Red Rover, Red Rover. <laughs> but also often, we're like red light, green light. I'm so glad I beat the devil today. Whoa, where'd you come from? Do you notice anything weird about the armor? It's all front facing. Did you get that? It, it's front facing. Don't turn your back on the enemy. Don't put your shield down. Don't put your sword down. Don't take, you want to be like Goliath? Take off your helmet. I guarantee you, he's going to put a rock right in the middle of your head. Stay fully armored. Pray without ceasing. One other thing I want to add about warfare. We're going back to 2 Chronicles. And it's really ironic because every morning, Christy and I send scriptures or, or prayers to the kids. And it was really ironic because she sent this one this morning. <coughs> Look with me to 2 Chronicles. We actually talked about this um, early on in this series. No, it's not 2 Chronicles. <coughs> yes, it is. Um, sorry, I was in the wrong chapter. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, I, I did a whole message on this. If you didn't hear that message, go back and look at this because I believe that this is a model for us. Okay? Backstory is this the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Moonites came against Jehoshaphat. It's a great army. Three great armies are coming up against him. Jehoshaphat goes into the temple and he calls out to God. He prays. He prays. And God tells him, get up and go out. I'm, I'm going to show you victory. So we're going to pick up right there. Uh, verse 18. It says, Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in a very loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. Can you see the, the progress right here? He stands up. They, they bowed. They stood up. He tells them what they need to do. You have to believe. 
Hebrews tells us without faith it's impossible to please God. Okay? You have to believe. And then he points out those to do what? To worship. 22. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy each other. Okay? So the people are going out. God has called them to go out of Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to fight this battle for you. And they go out singing. They put the worshipers in front. They put the worshipers in front. And the army followed behind. And when they got to the top of the pass and they looked down where all these armies were set and encamped against them, they were dead. Did the Israelites do anything to wipe them out? No. And yes. They do the same things we need to do. They prayed. They got on their face before God. And they prayed. And they believed. And they set their hearts to believe what God had said he would do, he would do. And they worshipped. Man, when they're going out there, they have no idea what's over that pass. But they're worshiping him. They are giving him praise. They are making a joyful noise. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love is enduring in your life right now. In this moment where you are in this place, in this situation, in this circumstance, God's steadfast love endures. So take up the whole armor of God. Put it on. Get ready to fight. And then get on your knees and win the battle. Let God come in and defeat the enemy for you. Stand firmly planted. The enemy cannot shake you. He's locked up behind the walls. He's scared to death of the spirit that lives inside of you. Greater is the spirit that lives in me than the one that lives in this world. And then rout the enemy. Send him fleeing. Tear down those walls. Break open those gates. Move forward fully armored and go with worship and prayer. Singing his praises. Thanking him for all he has done and all that he has said he will yet do. Amen? Amen. God, I thank you that you are good to us. Father, your steadfast love endures forever. Father, from the highest of heights to the uttermost depths of our walk, your love endures forever. <coughs> you are our shield and defender. You are our high tower, our refuge, our place of safety. You cover us with the shield of your favor, and you shelter us in the shadow of your wing. If you are for us, who can stand against us? I thank you, Father, that you have called us to battle, but a battle that is not waged as the flesh and blood would wage it. It's not waged in a way that makes sense to this world. Victory is through surrender, giving ourselves over completely to you and allowing you to fight for us.
locking shields together, upholding one another, bearing one another's burdens, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, even rebuking one another if needed. We bless you today, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you live inside of us. That you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are always there. Help us, Father, to look through the fence and see those things on the other side that you are calling us to. Help us, Father, to tear those strongholds down, tear those fences down, to move forward. Father, I ask if there would be any here today that do not know you. Father, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, your word tells us that we confess and we believe. Father, all that is required unto salvation, you have told us, is faith and grace. Your grace poured out so abundantly that it completely swallows all sin. ask, Lord God, that if any would be here today hurting, that you would be the healer, the comforter. Father, any that are struggling, that you would uphold them. Any that are weak, you would strengthen them. Father, those that have needs, you would be the answer. Father, we ask your forgiveness for the stubbornness of our hearts, our pride, <clears throat> Father, that separates us from you. Father, I confess my sin, <clears throat> my failure to turn to you, to call out to you. confess my, my poor treatment of Christy. I thank you, God, because your word promises that if we confess our sin, you are just. You are just and able to forgive us our sins. And I ask, Lord God, that you would break the chains that bind us that you would loose the captives and that we would walk in the freedom that you have given us. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>